it is because of you that we exist. It's because of you holding our molecules together right at this moment that we continue to exist. It's your breath in our lungs. Not just in the first moments of life, but in every breath of life. And Lord, to realize that we can trust you, especially um, during a time when this disease, that's exactly what it does, is it takes people's breath away. Um, Lord, remind us of the hope that we have because of our faith in you. And so that when this worship service is over, we feel closer to you, more encouraged, and more ready to be the people that you want us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you all. And a couple of words before we get started. Number one, thank you to uh, Rebecca Waring, who brought Girl Scout cookies for us, which are set up in the back back there. And also to um, Jane and John uh, Greer, who brought us kolaches. So the uh, tech crew and the musicians and I have all put on about five pounds since the beginning of the morning. So thank you all for that. It was very sweet, literally. Um, also, in case you weren't here right at the beginning of the service, we are doing communion. And we would love to have you share in that with us. So... If you haven't already done so, run to your pantry, to your fridge, and get something that you can use for communion, a bit of bread and something in a cup. And then uh, I have had uh, people start to ask me when we are going to open up again for public worship. And um, the elders and I will be meeting um, this Wednesday via Zoom, elders, and we will be talking about policies and procedures and a timetable for how to resume our public worship. So uh, as soon as we have that meeting, uh, sometime later this week, we'll begin to get that information out to everybody else. Um, but would very much appreciate your prayers now, and especially Wednesday at 7 p.m., that the Holy Spirit would give us some guidance on all these things. Because these are really hard decisions, and we live in a pretty anxious, anxiety-filled time right now. In fact, um, I can't remember when, I mean, I talk to people, and they just kind of burst into tears uh, as soon as I start talking to them. And I'm pretty sure it's not me. I'm pretty sure it's the anxiety levels. Um, that people are just stressed. I mean, they're worried about their, their families getting sick. They're... Um, you know, we, yes, we're starting to open things up, but then people are worried about another spike in the, in the, in the virus and <laughs> closing the economy down for more because the economy is pretty darn scary too. I mean, 30 million people within the last six weeks have applied for unemployment. That's terrifying. And I, I read somewhere, I can't remember where it was, that perhaps 50% of the world's population is going to be out of a job soon. So that is a real source of stress. And then, of course, you have to be careful about how much news you consume because, hey, the way that they get you to click on stuff is they put out the scary headline of one kind or another. And then, you know, you might expect for our political leaders to sort of be those calm, reassuring presences, which is prompting laughter from the back row back there because, you know, the, the political leaders just seem to want to point the finger at the other politicians in the other party and say, well, those people are destroying, you know, destroying our civilization. And everybody just seems to be sort of amping up the anxiety and the fear. And in a time of fear and anxiety, I'm going to move this over just a little bit. In a time of fear and anxiety, what keeps us going is, is hope. I mean, hope, hope is that light at the end of the tunnel. Hope is the, the compass point that lets you know that you are going to get through the wilderness. Hope is what gets you out of bed in the morning. And during the times of high anxiety, during the hard times, people put their hope in all kinds of places. 
But what the Bible says is that the only sure source of hope is in God. Paul, the apostle, writes in Romans, he says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says the source of hope there is. It's God, but specifically our ability to trust in him. That if you want to have more hope, you need to have more faith, or at least make sure that you're putting your faith in the right thing, because a lot of times we put our faith in things other than God, and then those things don't pan out. So what we need to do is find our trust in God in the midst of this so that then we'll have hope to get through this. Um, so with that in mind, I want to spend the next few weeks or however long, my poor musicians, they're always like, well, what's the plan? And I'm like, there is no plan. that's Molly saying, there is no plan. There is a plan. It's God's plan. And he lets me know when he's ready, okay? But we are going to be reading through uh, Peter's first letter because that letter is all about Peter giving courage and hope to people who are going through a difficult time. So with that in mind, let's just read the first two verses of the book. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Listen now to the word of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. All right, in this age of Snapchat and texting and emails, we don't write too many letters anymore, but you learned, right, Molly? Last time I asked you about what kids learned in elementary school, you weren't really sure how to answer me, and you're an elementary age teacher. All right, so one of the things that you learn in, and I'm not even going to mention the math teacher behind the camera there, right? Um, that you learn how to write a formal letter when you're in grade school. And yes, you do. Thank, thank you, Molly. Um, and you learn that there is a form that you have to follow, that there's a salutation, basically a greeting, who is this letter to? And then there's the body of the letter, and then you write who the letter is from at the end of the letter. And I know that you know, because we've talked about this before, that in the ancient world, they also had a structure for a letter, but it was just a little bit different than our modern form. In the ancient form, they started off with who the letter was from. This letter is from Peter, an apostle. And then they wrote who the letter is to. This is to God's elect who are scattered through the various provinces. And then they wrote the, the, the body of the letter. And that address of the letter really communicates, sets the tone for the rest of the letter. And remember, this letter is about and just, I just read you, all I read you was like the, the address. Who is it to and who is it from? But right there, you already have the, the gist of where he says our hope is. It's based on how God addresses us, right? I mean, when you address a letter, when you're writing a letter, if you ever write a letter, um, you, you, know, you can really tell a lot about the relationship, right? When you're writing a business letter, right? When you're saying, look, we don't, we're not really friends, but we're business associates. You learned in school, you write, dear sir or dear madam. And that lets them know the context, right? Or sometimes people ask me for a letter of reference. And traditionally, when you're addressing a letter of reference, you write, to whom it may concern. And what I'm saying there is, look, I know you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I hope you'll listen to what I have to say anyway. And then there's a completely different address you give when it's a personal letter. You know, dear so-and-so. And if it's a really special relationship, 
Like, you know, if I'm going to write my wife a note, I wouldn't write Dear Allie, but I might write To My Dearest Allie or something like that because she's the dearest relationship in my life, right? So you, you say a lot about the relationship in the address. And what Peter is saying in this address is he's saying, here's why you have hope, because here's what God thinks of you. Here is God defining his relationship with you. And how does he address us, right? What does he say there in verse 1? He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Well, what the heck does that mean, right? I mean, when was the last time somebody referred to you as the elect? Well, the Greek word there is eklektos, which is where we get the word elect. And um, the word just literally means to be chosen. Right? When we elect somebody, when we hold an election, we are choosing someone for a particular role or a particular job. And so that's you know, just means those who are chosen, which is how the New Living Translation translates the verse. A few weeks ago, I said, look, I like to use the New International Version of the Bible and the New Living Translation. And the NIV is a little bit more word for word, a little bit more technical. And the New Living Translation is a little bit more meaning for meaning. And so you see in the New Living Translation, it says, I'm writing to God's chosen people. Right? So Peter is saying to you, God has chosen you. And that is, um, you know, that's the traditional language from the Old Testament when God is talking about his people, defining who they are, they are the chosen people, right? The very first chosen person, anybody want to take a shot at who it is in the Bible? There's only a few of you. There's nowhere for you to hide. Does anybody know who's described as the first chosen person in the Bible? It's, 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 it's Abraham. Yeah, that's right. It's Abraham. Uh, you are the Lord God, the prophet Nehemiah says, who chose Abram and brought him from Ur, the land of the Chaldeans, and renamed him Abraham. And then, of course, Abraham has all of these children who have children, and they become this nation. And the whole nation, all of Abraham's descendants, are described as God's chosen people. Isaiah writes, as for you, Israel, he's talking to the whole nation, my servant, Jacob, another name for Israel, my chosen one, descended from Abraham, my friend. So Peter is taking all of that language, all of that thinking about the chosen people, and now he is applying it to us, the followers of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, you have been chosen. You are God's elect. And that's pretty cool, right? That's who we are. God has chosen you. And that, you know, if you're trying to think about, you know, who am I as a human being to think of yourself? I mean, it feels pretty good to get chosen, right? I mean, when you're on the schoolyard, we're in the time for PE, and they would de- de- take two different captains, and you were going to play a game, and then the captains would pick people. Um, it always felt pretty crummy to be one of the last people picked. It felt really good to be one of the first people chosen. And Rich is nodding because he was probably one of the first people chosen because he's a little athlete. Um, but to know that they chose you, they weren't stuck with you, and to realize God chose you. He's not stuck with you. That's a really good feeling. Now, we talk about being chosen, and that that leads to some questions, right? Because then people say, okay, well, God chose me, and I believe in him, but I know that I have this relative or this friend, and they don't believe. Does that mean that God didn't choose them? And then you get into all kinds of complicated uh, questions about, well, does this mean that God chooses some people to believe and chooses some people not to believe? Does God choose some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell? Does God, choo- does God create some people just to destroy them? Now, there is, a, there is a minority of Christian thinkers and um, teachers that have had that concept of being chosen. 
Um, look, if y'all ever want me to preach on what is called Calvinism, I know that some of you came out of, out of congregations that, that taught that. If you ever want me to preach on Calvinism, I will. That's not the subject for this morning. I do have a lot of love and respect for my Calvinist brothers and sisters. I respect some of the things that they're trying to protect and emphasize, God's grace, God's sovereignty. Um, but I am not a Calvinist. And I don't think their interpretation of these verses is the correct one. Um, the majority of Christian thinkers, Christian teachers, down through Christian history, have had a different interpretation. Not that God chooses you to be saved and chooses you to be damned. And, um, oh, you can see that right in this passage, I believe, because in verse 2, it says that we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, for the, the Greek word for foreknowledge there is actually a word that you know because medical doctors use it. It's the word prognosis. That's directly from the Greek, right? In, if you know anything, if you ever been to a doctor and they gave you a prognosis, what were they telling you? They were telling you what they thought the outcome would be. You were going to get sicker. You were going to get better. Here's how your health was going to look. But it was an educated guess. But a prognosis is here's what we think is going to happen ahead of time, right? Foreknowledge. Well, God is not a human being, right? Just as if God is in all places at once, God is in all times at once. So God's foreknowledge, his prognosis, is not an educated guess. God knows what's going to happen. And the traditional interpretation of this passage is that God knew ahead of time who would respond with faith and who wouldn't respond with faith. You have been chosen according to God's foreknowledge of whether or not you would come to faith or not. That's the traditional understanding of this. Not that God decided before the foundation of the world that he was going to create you and then send you to hell. And you have no free will about it, you see. But there's more to it than that. Because... Our chosenness is based upon the chosenness of Jesus. Now, if you continue to look through 1 Peter, he doesn't talk as much about us being chosen as he does about Jesus being chosen. For instance, in verse 20 of chapter 1, we read that Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world. And then in chapter 2, Peter writes, Jesus is the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God. That Jesus is chosen. Now, what I've said to you all multiple times is that when we're joined together with Jesus by faith, we get linked with him so that what belongs to him is now shared with us. Right? Paul says in multiple places that we have been united with Jesus in his death. As if we ourselves were crucified. As if we had been the obedient ones who said, not my will, but thy will be done. And the benefits of the crucifixion now are applied to us as if we had been crucified. You see? And then we've been joined together in his resurrection so that now we have eternal life and that now we can look forward to our own bodily resurrection because we've been joined together by faith with Jesus who's been resurrected. And that Jesus' status, for instance, as God's son is now shared with us so that now God is our Abba Father and we too are children of God. When we're joined together with Jesus, what is true of him becomes true of us. And that is also true of his status as the chosen one. That now that we are joined together, we are with him and we too have been chosen. So that is the traditional understanding of 
why and how and what being chosen means. That because we have faith, which God knew we would have, we've been joined together with the chosen one, and now we too are chosen. Now the question then becomes, well, chosen for what? Right? He's picked us to be on his team. What's the game? And this is where people also have some messed up ideas about what it means to be chosen because they think, well, if I'm chosen and you're not, that means God loves me and he doesn't love you. That God has chosen me because I'm up here and you're down, out, down there. And look, in the scriptures, everybody who's ever chosen is not chosen just for themselves. They're chosen in order to go out and be a blessing to others and bring them to God. Now, who'd we say was the first one who was chosen in the Bible? Abraham. There you go. All right. And all the way back in the beginning of Abraham's story in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham that he is going to use Abraham not just to raise up and have a family that's blessed, but in order to bless all the families, all the people of the world. And then Israel is chosen they're chosen and God's light shines on them, but they're not chosen so that the rest of the world can stay in darkness. What does Isaiah say? Nations will come to your light and kingdoms to the brightness of your dawn. And he's talking to the nation of Israel in that moment. And if you look in 1 Peter, he says exactly the same thing to us. Oh, where are we? 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen people. You are, a royal, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Eh? For he called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. All right, so are you feeling a little hopeless this morning? Are you struggling to have hope? Let it not be so. God has chosen you and given you a purpose. You have been called to show others the goodness of God. And you can show God's goodness to your children, to your parents. You can show God's goodness to your co-workers. You can show God's goodness to the checkout worker at the grocery store and the delivery person who brings you your package. Through His Son, God has shown you kindness and forgiveness. Share that kindness and forgiveness with others. What have you been chosen for? You have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. And with your words and actions, draw people to the source of all blessings, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that and you will have hope. Now, that doesn't mean that things are always easy. Anyone who tells you that, yes, you are chosen, and now it's easy street. Once you've been chosen, you are not going to have the same problems that everybody else has. Well, you might not have quite the same problems that everybody else has, but it doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. right? Anybody who tells you well, that now that you are chosen, it's all health and wealth and you're going to be great, they are setting you up to fail. Because then when the hard times come, if you think chosen people don't have hard times, what are you going to assume? God's left me, or I was never chosen. I won't ask for a show of hands of people here. Or I, well, of course, I can't see. I could, I could see the comments if you were to make the comments. I won't ask for them. If you've ever been through a hard time and thought, you know what, this whole business about God loving me, caring about me, I don't know that I believe it anymore. I won't ask for a share of hands because you know what? Probably all of us have had a moment like that. And when Peter defines who we are, he doesn't say you are God's chosen and you are not going to have any problems. Look back at what he says here. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, which is, these are all parts of what is now Turkey. Exiles who are scattered throughout the provinces. The Greek word for exile there is uh, literally to live in the land as a foreigner. 
And actually, that's the way the, the New Living Translation, this is one of the moments where the New Living Translation is actually a little bit more technically correct than the, uh, the NIV, because the NLT, right, I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners. Now, what do we call people that live as foreigners in the land? We call them immigrants. That's exactly right. And we have quite a few people in our congregation who are immigrants from other countries. And so they may be better able to understand this verse than uh, some of the rest of us. That when you live as a foreigner in the land, there are all these things that are difficult about it. You have different customs and different ways to live and different, you just, your way of life is just a little bit different from the natives of the land. And sometimes the natives of the land, they, they resent you and don't like you and don't even want you there and see you as a problem and they see you as a threat, and you may be economically vulnerable when you are living as a foreigner in the land, and you're vulnerable to prejudice and to mistreatment. And this, Peter says, is what it is like for God's chosen people who live scattered among others. Because as followers of Jesus, we have different customs, we have different values that may seem strange to the natives. We, too, can be misunderstood and disliked and resented. We can feel out of place. It's hard to be an immigrant. In a similar way, it's hard to be God's chosen people. And Peter's going to go on in this, in this letter and give us encouragement. But let's remember that the very people that we are scattered among, the very peop- there are the very people that we're supposed to bless. The very people who misunderstand us and may be hostile or difficult or unlovable are the very ones that we are called to love. God chose you. God chose you. Wherever you are, I want you to know that wherever you are sitting right in this moment, God chose you. He chose you to share his goodness with all the people around you. You have a reason to get up in the morning. Are you going through a difficult time right now? Well, before the foundations of the world, according to his foreknowledge, God chose you in his son, Jesus. God chose you to be his child. He chose you to be a blessing. You are blessed.